All right, well, well welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Tunick. I'm a program manager uh, in, in aviation. I think probably most of us are, are aviation here, but everyone's welcome. Thanks to, to Gavin, who normally organizes our little men's group over lunch. And uh, they were asking if for Lent, maybe I would I would do something to use my my previous background, as I said in the meeting invite. So I'm coming up on my year anniversary here at Garmin, but before that I spent 20 years in ministry and seminary as a Catholic priest. And so a lot of our group is Catholic, but I invited several others on here. So uh, it'll be maybe a little Catholic influence today. And uh, my advanced degrees are in liturgy and studying the mass and the sacraments and things like that. So I always work in a lot of liturgical things uh, when I talk, but um, I, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful first uh, year here at Garmin for me, and I, I really love our, our culture and uh, the fact that we can have a little meeting like this over lunch is is great. So part of uh, what we do for Lent, I always would tell people there are there are things that you you give up uh, like chocolate or, or whatever. Uh, but sometimes more important are the things that we we do additionally. So thanks to everyone who wants to join today and, and be here because this is just one of those additional things you can do. And uh, we kind of like to, to joke that the program that uh, Jason and I are on is uh, so intense that they had to hire a priest into the program department to to deal with <laughs> the uh, the program that we all know. Uh, so, um, you know, for, for me personally, it's great to be able to use. Uh, I always have to ask God, how do I how does he want to use me? And obviously that was maybe a little more obvious in answer to call to official public ministry. Uh, but then now that I'm, you know, doing aviation, uh, how do I use all that, that other stuff, the other stuff that I've learned, places that I've been. And so when I was thinking about what I could do for some Lenten meditations, I've gone around the country and I've done parish missions and, and spoken for Lent. Um, but I, I thought I've had the, the blessing to three times go to the Holy Land. And so I lived there for for three months, actually, when I was in in seminary. Uh, and so I got to go all around the places. So that was in 2006, 2007. And and then I went back in like 2012 and then again in 2020. So I've been around there and sometimes they'll re refer to the Holy Land as the, the fifth gospel. We know the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And of course, that's how we come to know a lot about our Lord's life and where he lived and but to actually physically be there uh in the places i know really has helped me in my prayer my meditation as we'll see when it says well jesus went to the wilderness for 40 days well what what does that actually look like and so that kind of sparked my interest like well maybe i could do that i can uh start off with uh, tie it to the geography and the actual physical places and especially as we go through these six weeks as we get closer to to Holy Week and the the events that took place in Jerusalem at the end of our Lord's life, his passion, death, resurrection, those are obviously very much physical places. Like you can go to the spot to this day. We know exactly where it's at. We know right where Calvary is at. We know right where his tomb is at and where he rose from the dead. Um, so to kind of journey through some of those those places. Uh, also, just because if if I were to advertise that I was just going to do some spiritual reflections for Lent, uh, people wouldn't come because that sounds super boring. Uh, in, in the church, we, we learn if you're, if you're gonna try to give anybody something spiritual, you have to like wrap it in something else. So like we just, we do a, like a big retreat we call the fire retreat that just happened. So like, oh, we're gonna talk about Jesus and we're gonna light things on fire. We're gonna use flamethrowers to create a huge camp for us. So you have to find things like that. So yeah, spiritual talks, but ooh, learn about the Holy Land too. Uh, so we can, we can hopefully do a little bit of that and but I, I do want it to be something that is, is worth our time over Lent to help us kind of prepare. So um, I've got up there. This is uh, this is me, my first time to the Holy Land. So that's in the, the Tel Aviv airport. That was kind of what uh, started this all a little bit. I got off the plane and 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 there it is. And oh, my goodness, I'm I'm in Israel. Now, the, the interesting thing is that there's Israel and then there's the, the West Bank. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of the, the geopolitical stuff of, of the modern day, but know that there there are, are two uh, at least entities there to, today that we're talking about. And uh, so the airport is in Tel Aviv, which is Israel. So there are welcome to uh, the, the Holy Land. Um, I will say that when I went there the first time, 
I wanted to keep in touch because I was there for three months. So you might imagine my parents missed me a bit, as did everyone back home. So what I did was I started a, a daily blog uh, where I would each day make a little meditation of here's what we did today. And that gave rise to uh, what is now my my website. So if you want to follow along even more into detail there, you can go to seanthebaptist.org. Sean is the Irish version of John. So John the Baptist is my patron saint. Uh, therefore, I'm Sean the Baptist. Not not dot com. There's like an actual Baptist pastor whose name is Sean, who has Sean the Baptist dot com. Don't go there. Go to <laughs> Sean the Baptist dot org. And there's a one of the menus is pilgrimages. And you can go and see that original blog from 2006, 2007, where it's like 70 days of here's what we did today and pictures and meditations and, and reflections and things like that. It's also got all my homilies from when I was a priest and uh, I'll put these talks up there too. So this will kind of be a, a reboot as it were of seanthebaptist.org because if you go there right now, the the last thing is, well, I was leaving ministry and then I got a job at Garmin and uh, this, you, this will be part of the reboot. So there we go. All right. So 48 days of, of Lent, we might just start with that. Uh, First of all, Lent, where does that word even come from? Uh, well, Lent means spring, which is a little interesting considering the majority of Christians now live south of the equator uh, where it's not spring, it's fall. Uh, so only in, in English and kind of Germanic derived things would we find the word Lent, which means spring. Most of the other languages, including the, the official language of the Latin church anyway, in Latin, it's some version of the, the number 40. So the official, if you were to look in the Latin Missal, it would say quadragesima, the 40 days. The quad, you can kind of recognize a 40 and gesima is, is days. So quadragesima, or in Spanish, quaresima, Italian, quaresima, the 40 days, uh, which makes a lot more sense considering northern, southern hemisphere, everything like that. Uh, so how, how do we get that? A little trivia for you. Uh, the number 40 for Lent, as we'll see, is, is symbolic. So even the calculus in it is a, a little bit symbolic. Uh, but if you want to get to how do we technically arrive at there being 40 days of Lent. So in the, the Catholic calendar, Lent, we know, starts on Ash Wednesday and it ends on Holy Thursday evening. So people ask, well, when when does Lent end? Well, well technically it ends uh, in the evening of Holy Thursday when a, a season all to its own begins called the three days, the Triduum. So if you were to count from Ash Wednesday to Holy Thursday evening, you would get 44. Uh, but that's not very symbolic. So like, OK, well, the Sundays are technically not fast days. So take out the Sundays. But Good Friday and Holy Saturday are fast days. So if you add those back in, you get 40. Uh, and there are various ways this has been computed, and the Eastern churches do things a little bit different themselves. Uh, so, yeah, if you want a little math trivia, that's that's how we come up with 40 days of Lent. But more importantly, why why 40 days in the first place? Well, there's there's a couple different reasons why 40 is significant in in the Bible, and so this is where we get more into the the spiritual side with the mathematical trivia out of the way. So if you remember one of the uh, the greatest movies in all time, The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston as, as Moses, uh, they, uh, they are famously, the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt. You know, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name gets changed to Israel. And there's that famous other musical, Joseph and the Amazing Ten of Color Dreamcoat. And, and that's how Andrew Lloyd Webber gets all the chosen people down from Israel into Egypt. And then eventually there's this incredible slavery in Egypt because, well, Joseph and his musical ends. And it says that there comes a new pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph like 400 years later, and they're all in slavery. And that is a great way to begin Lent, realizing slavery as the, the backdrop. Because ultimately, spiritual, as we'll see, slavery to sin. That's really when we want to move the whole purpose of Lent as it is, is to move from slavery to sin to freedom. That's if we want to say, what do we really want to do during Lent? That's it. We want to go from slavery to freedom, slavery from sin to new life, new freedom in God, which is, is really what Easter is all about. So the, the backdrop for that is the Israelites then, God famously sends Moses, Charlton Heston, to, well, set them free. 
he tells Moses, go, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh says no. And of course, the, we have the famous 10 plagues. And eventually, Pharaoh says, OK, y'all get out of here. I don't ever want to see you again. And we have the greatest scene in movie history with the parting of the Red Sea. And Israel goes out of Egypt into the wilderness. And famously, they're on their way to Mount Sinai, where they get the Ten Commandments. And then they are told to go to the Promised Land, which is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived. What we would know today is, is the modern area of Israel. God promised Abraham that, that land. That's why we call it the, the Promised Land. And so they leave Egypt, they get the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, and they go up to the Promised Land. There's just one problem. They, they get to the Promised Land, and they're all ready to to cross in and, and take it because God said, I'm giving you this land. This is it. I promised it to Abraham and his descendants forever. Go ahead, go take it. But they're scared because there are people already in the promised land. And so they send 12 scouts. I like to think of Boy Scouts. I'm a Boy Scout. So they send 12 scouts who go into the promised land and they look around and they find out wow, there are really formidable people already living here. We don't think we can do it. And so the, the scouts come back and 10 of the 12 of them report back to the Israelites. We should just turn around right now. We, we can't do it. It's, there, there are giants living in this land. And only two of them, famously Joshua, who will eventually lead them in, and Caleb, so Joshua and Caleb say, no, look, yeah, it's, it's going to be hard, but God told us we would do it. So if God said we should just go in and do it because God will be with us and who cares if they're giants or we're going to have to fight or trust God. In the end, as is often the case, the 10 outrule the two and everyone agrees with the people who are afraid. And so instead of entering the promised land, they have to wander. And this is where our verse from Numbers uh, picks up. Because your men explored the land for 40 days, those are the 12 scouts, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sins. So the first 40 that we see in the Bible that is important for our Lenten journey is this 40 years that the Israelites actually wander in the wilderness. So this would be the, the wilderness outside of the Holy Land, down through the Sinai Peninsula, 40 years. And notice that the, the reason for this is that they are to suffer the consequences of their sins. 40 is a, an important number here because it also represents the number of years in a generation. It literally means all the people who are too afraid to enter the promised land don't get to. We're going to wait for the next generation and they're going to get their own chance to see, will they do better? So the first wandering in the wilderness is a punishment. And, and notice when whenever God punishes, it, it's it's never like vindictive or like just because God needs to show his authority or something. God, God is all powerful. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need to show how powerful he is. His authority is not infringed upon just because we reject him, which is a good thing to keep in mind. All sin is ultimately bad for us. Doesn't doesn't hurt God. God can't suffer. God gives us his law and tells us what is what is good and what is sinful for the sole purpose of making us happy. If the Israelites had gone in and taken the promised land, they would have been very happy. Instead, they said, well, we don't trust you, God. So God has to say, all right, well, if you are going to be far away from me, literally in your hearts, I'm going to let you experience in your body that you are, in fact, far away from me. You are not in the promised land. You are not in your home. You're going to wander for, for 40 years. And so it's meant to be, it says suffering the consequences of your sins, but it's meant to be medicinal to heal them to allow them to not trust in themselves. And of course, famously in the wilderness, God gives them water, water from a rock. Uh, Moses actually strikes a rock and God gives them water. He gives them manna, so he gives them bread to eat in the wilderness. So God, yes, they're going to wander, but God is also with them. Famously, there's a pillar of cloud and a column of fire. And there's the tabernacle in the wilderness where God comes to dwell. So yes, they're exiled, but God is also with them. So I, that's a really important part, I think, to remember. And whatever weaknesses we're bringing into the season of Lent, whatever way we're enslaved and we want to be free, 
God is going to allow us to suffer the consequences of our sin, but he is with us and he wants to heal us and ultimately bring us to freedom. So when we hear 40, our first thought can be to this wandering in the wilderness. We are perhaps needing to be purged, as it were, from all that separates us from God. So that's that's the first spiritual kind of meaning of this. And so I want to show you a little bit. If you wonder, like, well, what does it mean to wander in the wilderness? Well, here's a little bit of it. I mean, we're going down the road. I just snapped that picture right right out of there. So there's going down the road there. I mean, imagine spending 40 years going through that. Uh, you know, that's big and, and open and there's not much there. And you can imagine it was the same time. At, when they were wandering. It's just this open wilderness. And to give you an idea, here's a little map for you. So we, we've got, uh, my mouse doesn't show up. There's probably a way I could do that. Uh, but you see the, the cities of, of Jericho there. That's the Dead Sea down on the bottom. And that little blue strip that goes up, that's the Jordan River. So on the left-hand side, the west, is is uh, the majority of the promised land in Israel that we know today. If the map went over further to the left, you'd see the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Jerusalem is down about, oh, seven o'clock-ish on that map up in, in the hills. But I put up uh, here this map because Jericho will be very important uh, because this is, this is where the Israelites will eventually cross the Jordan River in, into the promised land. And you can see the shading on there, just like I showed in the pictures, it's pretty barren. Uh, there is a little bit of life down by the water, and then it's pretty dry up in, in all those hills. So for 40 years, they have to wander around, and then eventually, under Joshua, they will cross the Jordan River, take the city of Jericho, and enter in the Promised Land, and again, disobey God. <laughs> over and, and over and over. And this is the story. So why do we have to do Lent every year? Well, because every year we eventually some way tell God, no, we're not going to do it his way. And we need to relearn again. Yes, we'll do it God's way. And it's better if we do it God's way. So eventually they do go in and cross over in, in Jericho. But I bring this up because our next spot that we're going to talk about, our next 40, uh, takes place right in that area around Jericho and in those hills. So this is from our gospel, if you're Catholic, that we read at Mass last last Sunday for the first Sunday of Lent, Gospel of Mark, the Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, that place we were just looking at, and he remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert. Now, that's, that's interesting. So, in the first case, the Israelites got punished by having to wander. They didn't choose to wander for 40 years. God had to do that to them. Jesus is actually going there because the Spirit drives him there. He wants to go there. Jesus chooses to enter into 40 days, as it were, symbolic of those 40 years. Jesus actually chooses this testing, this suffering, really. And, and that's really what we're doing here at the beginning of Lent ourselves. Uh, we are not being forced to to do anything for Lent. People would often come to me and ask, Father, is it okay if I give up this for Lent? And what if I give up just chocolate? And in the big question, like, Father, if if I gave up this for Lent, does Sunday count? I mean, can I can I you know do the thing I gave up? Can I do it on Sundays in Lent? And I would always just have to respond, there are no rules. The church doesn't actually even say you have to give up something for Lent. This is all voluntary. So. I, I would tell people, you know, like, well, if you're going to, you know, give up going to the movies for Lent, for instance, probably doesn't make sense that you go to the movies every Sunday just because Sundays don't count. Like I went to the movies six times during Lent, but I gave up movies for Lent, but not Sundays. That would be a little weird. On the other hand, if you're going to give up eating anything except bread and water for all of Lent, I could say, OK, you could probably have something more than bread and water on Sundays. But in the end, there are no rules. So that's the kind of beautiful thing about this. Just as Jesus chooses to go to the wilderness to be tested, we we choose voluntarily during Lent to decide, what am I going to give up? What, am, what additional am I going to do? And we really, so many times in the Catholic Church, especially, there are like all these rules. Like people often ask, well, what does the church teach about this? And like, sometimes I had to say, church doesn't teach anything about that. You, you get to decide. It's up to you. Uh, because ultimately, 
yes, it's good that we have like rules that kind of help us that we're headed in the right direction. But most of the Christian life is is freedom in our relationship with God, because in the end, that's that's what we want. <laughs> we want a relationship with God. And just as you probably can't create a lot of rules to govern exactly how you're going to have a relationship with your spouse, uh, God leaves us pretty free to respond to him. That's the whole point. So if you're thinking, what should I give up for Lent? There are no rules. Figure it out. You are going voluntarily into this time of testing to test yourself and to ultimately grow closer to God. So if at the end of Lent you gave up something like really hard and at the end of Lent you feel like, yeah, look at me. I did it. I'm so awesome. Well, you probably just puffed yourself up in pride and uh, maybe committed the sin of pride all of Lent. I don't know. So don't get too hung up on what am I going to give up? What am I going to do? What will draw you closer to God? I mean, for me, I actually had to kind of double down on my my morning routine a little bit. I'd gotten out of it where I I want to get up at six and then kind of get my prayer time in from 630 to 730 and then drive into work. And, you know, there were some days where that wasn't quite happening. I'm like, no, I'm just I'm just going to actually do that each day. I'm going to get up and I'm going to I'm going to pray the, the liturgy of the hours for me, the office of readings and morning prayer. And I want to get a half hour of meditation on scripture and the readings. And I'm going to I'm going to make sure I do that. And so there's something that's kind of like I'm, I'm taking on. I'm like sacrificing time a little bit, if you will, just like everyone today has given up a little bit of time over lunch to be here. So and then, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to see like, well, what foods are maybe a little bit too decadent? Maybe I give up dessert or whatever. The problem with giving up like chocolate or food or something is Easter comes and like I give up chocolate for, for Lent. And then when Easter comes. Give me all the Russell Stover cream eggs that I can like gorge on on Sunday. And then I'm like in a coma all Sunday afternoon on Easter. So if we give up certain food, we're just going to go back to that when Easter comes. So I always like to kind of add something that like when Easter comes, I want to be in a better spot that I'm not just going to like go back to doing something I gave up. But, but if I have that habit of maybe I added prayer or something like that, well, then maybe that's a good habit. So he's in the, the desert. And so here's a little picture of the spot. So this is called the Mount of the Temptation. It's right across from Jericho. So literally, Jesus goes up this, this mountain is the traditional spot in, in the wilderness. And we'll see there's a there's a little monastery up there. But that that town right below there is Jericho, modern day Jericho, right near the ruins of of ancient Jericho. And if we zoom in, there is a monastery built on the side of the Mount of Temptation. You're like, why on earth would someone want to live there? Well, the same way Jesus went out into the wilderness to be be tested, there are monks that, that live there year round and they they pray and fast and they too wanted to detach themselves more from the, the things of this life. And so uh, I've been there several times now. So it's way up on that that mountain. So you go partly by a cable car and then you, you hike up uh, the rest of the way. And then when you get up there, this is the view today, and it would be similar to the, the view that Jesus would have had, except without the modern city. And that's looking straight east. And so those those kind of hills in the background, that's Jordan. And that little green strip across the middle is the Jordan River. So that's the, the boundary between Israel and Jordan. And uh, that's what you see when you're you're looking out on the, the top of the Mount of Temptation. And if you go in the monastery, Street's pretty small. There's a, a beautiful little chapel there. Uh, there are uh, iconostasis there for those familiar with the Eastern worship tradition so that the sanctuary of their chapel is, is behind there. And then the go-to point, as it were, is this. This is the rock upon which Jesus supposedly sat as he was tempted and looked out over that view. Now, is that the actual rock? There are, as we go through our Holy Land journey here, there are certain things that we know exactly where they happened. Like I mentioned, the tomb of Jesus and even his birth in Bethlehem. Like we know those spots are the spot. Is this the rock Jesus sat on during his 40 days of temptation? I don't know, but there is a rock probably that he sat on. I'm guessing he sat on quite a few rocks. This might be one of them. Nonetheless, this is where people go. In case you Google Mount the Temptation or Temptation Abbey, you're going to see this picture because this is supposedly the rock of temptation. But before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about that word temptation. So the Latin word here is tentatio. It's 
It may be better translated as, as testing. Uh, so notice it says that the spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, tested. Um, we, we hear temptation and I think we automatically think, oh, this is this is bad. Really think of it as testing and uh, testing is not bad. In fact, I right before I did, I didn't get a chance to put it in the slides because uh, the morning has just been crazy. But I, I went out and I, I took a picture of sys test. So Andrew's bench out there. Uh, we think of testing here. So I'll try to work in the Holy Land. I'm going to try to work in some aviation stuff too. But but think of all the effort that we put into testing our, our software and our hardware uh, before we, we field it. Now you can ask Andrew if he thinks testing is bad or not. Uh, it might indeed be suffering. Uh, but we invest a lot of money in testing at, at Garmin. We have an entire department that just does we should call it the temptation department, maybe, because uh, maybe it's temptation to to give up <laughs> and, and quit. I don't know. Uh, it's rough in in testing, uh, even for Garmin, but we recognize that it's like actually important, and we're gonna we're gonna run things through the same thing like over and over and over again uh, to see, you know, to to really kind of groove it. Like my morning routine. The, the last week it was it was almost kind of hard to like be committed to it every day, but if you keep testing it over and over and over you, you kind of you build up you, you kind of groove it a little bit and and that's really how if we add stuff during lent to form those habits like that's testing am i going to get out of bed at six o'clock or not i mean that's one of the greatest temptations there is like i could just hit the snooze bar and go back to bed and it would be so nice and then i i keep telling myself why is it that just lying here feels so much better is it really going to be any easier to get up five minutes after having snoozed? Like, no, it's not. I just need to get up and and do it. Well, that's that's testing. That's temptation. Uh, now, Jesus went into the wilderness and, and underwent quite a, a bit additional temptation, but not all temptation is bad. So we know Satan is going to try to tempt us. There, there are, are three major enemies that we have, the world, the flesh, the devil. Those are the 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 normal ones we always point to. So everyone wants to think of, oh, the, the devil testing us. And that that's true. Satan is powerful. He's a fallen angel. He's way more smart than us. Uh, he tries to outsmart Jesus, for goodness sake, in his temptation. So yes, Satan is there and is going to try to tempt us. Uh, but that's that's probably, of all the, the worries of the three, probably the world, uh, the flesh. So we always think of flesh and we think of like sexual sins or things like that. Overeating, gluttony, all those things, sure, th those are all temptations. Great. I, I would just draw our attention to the other one, though, the world. Notice where Jesus goes to be tested. He goes out in the wilderness. He gets far away. Most of our temptation, I think, that we really struggle with today is, is that worldly part. You know, think of just how tempted I am. Like, I can pull up my phone now and, you know, be on Facebook or Instagram and just immerse myself in worldly things. And and even think about things that are good, like the news. Uh, ooh, I, I got to stay informed. So I'm going to watch the news. And then the news is just on constantly. You know, I, I, I don't listen to the much of the, the TV anymore because it's just I realized after a while with the news, they're just they're just trying to sell me stuff in the commercials in between. And I'm like, I just I would finish watching the news and I'd be just all upset and worried. I'm like, why am I doing that? And so to fast, at least from from some of that, my my roommate and I, he's given up TV for for Lent. So it, it it's kind of nice that, you know, we just don't have that. I don't watch a whole lot of TV, but it's like noticeably quieter around the house in the evenings now when I get home. And uh, my my fiance, Mary, doesn't even have uh, a TV uh, when I go over to her house. We actually if we want to watch a movie or something, we pull out a little iPad. So this whole idea of the wilderness, it's its a pretty sacred sort of place in our, our religious tradition. Going to the wilderness is not a bad thing. I, I'm, I'm a Boy Scout, so I, I like to go camping and, and backpacking. And, you know, why would I want to go sleep on the ground when I have a perfectly good bed at home? My, my parents ask me that sometimes. Right before I came to, to Garmin, I went, I decided I was going to go out into the wilderness. Uh, my wilderness for me was the the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and the, the Appalachian Trail. So in order to kind of, for me, to make that transition a little bit from maybe ministry life back to, to lay life, I decided, wow, well, they, the Israelites, when they 
left Mount Sinai before they entered the promised land that, you know, they went to the wilderness. So I'm like, I decided I would hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, not the whole thing that takes like four or five months. I didn't have that, but I did have a week. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to go hike the Appalachian Trail. And it's it's really kind of neat if, if you do backpacking, you realize just how much you you don't need. Um, I carried everything I needed for a week on my my back, you know, all my food and my water pump and everything, my tent and, you know, and I, I, I hiked all over the place and you really, you know, in the middle of Great Smoky Mountain National Park, you don't even have a cell phone. Uh, I did, however, meet people who had a Garmin in reach. I, I do not go without it now because I was in the middle of Great Smoky Mountain National Park and a huge snowstorm was coming and I didn't even know it. But people with their Garmin, they're like, dude, that snowstorm that was coming Saturday, it's coming Wednesday and it's not going to be an inch. It's going to be two feet of snow. We got to get out of here. Uh, but just to be out kind of in the mercy of the, the elements and realize, whoa, I'm not in control of everything. Notice it says like Jesus, he was out amongst the wild beasts. Great Smoky Mountain National Park is the home to the greatest concentration of black bears anywhere in the United States. And uh, so I'm like, am I going to get eaten by a bear? I mean, I, I kind of I know how to camp with bears and take care of your food. But I went out literally for a time of testing, and it was the most physically challenging thing I ever did. Uh, I gained like 5,000 feet the first day just to get to my camp. By the time I was done, I had climbed up 24,000 feet and and down like another 15,000. It was grueling. So many times I'm just like, I'm done. I, I want to quit. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I kept going. And then you do that and it strengthens your will. When you do things you are like, I didn't know I could do that, you get stronger. And so that's a, a little bit about what God was doing in the wilderness, what Jesus was doing in the wilderness, what all of us are called to do during Lent. Maybe we can't go you know, to a wilderness somewhere. We got our jobs, we got to keep working, we've got our families. But at least spiritually, how can we during Lent go to the wilderness? What do we need to get rid of? You know, maybe it's our, our phones, our internet, or TV, whatever. Maybe maybe we add things like we're going to go to a park with our family. We're, we're going to go for a hike. We're, we're going to go do something that is off the grid. Whatever it is, you know, there are no rules on this. But with the wilderness is kind of our, our backdrop. What What can we do this Lent? to go to the wilderness. Maybe it's just fasting from normal worldly things that, that maybe you will go back to. Or maybe Easter comes and you're like, you know, we really didn't miss that TV all that much. We did family game night instead. And we kind of like playing games instead of just sitting in front of the TV mindlessly. Who knows? Pray about it. Notice it's the spirit that drove Jesus into the wilderness. So let the spirit drive you this Lent to figure out what you want to do. But how can you spiritually go to the wilderness? Okay, with the, the wilderness apart then now, I'm going to finish up here with kind of the map of where we're going. Okay, so we, we've talked about, you know, going out into the wilderness and we start Lent with this 40 days and going out to be tempted. But where are we headed? Well, I kind of already hinted at it because at the end of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, where do the chosen people end up? They end up here. That is the Jordan River. And that happens to be the exact spot where we believe John the Baptist was baptizing. So notice Jesus, before he went out to be tempted, this is where he started from. This is, this is ultimately where we are heading uh, at Easter. Because really this journey through the wilderness is meant to end just as it did for the chosen people of a crossing of a river, as it were. And the church has always seen this as, as symbolic then of baptism. This is the spot where Jesus was baptized. So there is there is Sean the Baptist uh, standing at the, the spot where John the Baptist was baptizing. Uh, you can actually go down in the water. That's Jordan on the other side. So this is the, the international border as well. But you see, it's out there in the middle of of nowhere and here's this water and so the the church has always seen this as a sign of of baptism and i i would let you know that at the end of lent the end of the temptation well the, there is a test <laughs> uh as it were uh, to see how you did but it's it's not going to be god asking you yeah uh you chose to give up chocolate and uh how'd you do with that you didn't did you 
I saw those Hershey's Kisses you ate. Or like, oh, you were going to give up sweets. I saw you grab a cookie from the break room. You failed Lent. No, there's there's no one at the end of Lent going to be telling you you failed, you're successful. Sometimes I think it's actually good that we fail on our, our Lenten promises because then we don't get too puffed up and we realize we're not the ones in control of this. It's good to have goals, whatever. There is, however, uh, a test at the end of Lent. And it's going to happen either at the Easter Vigil or at Sunday Mass on Sunday morning. Because I much, much like uh, teachers love to give pop quizzes. What if you had the answers ahead of time or even the, the questions? So I'm, I'm going to help you because at that first Mass of Easter that you attend, the priest is going to get up and you're going to hear him say, brothers and sisters, now that we have completed our observance of Lent, let us renew the promises we made in holy baptism. And 90% of the people are going to be like, the promises are renewed in holy baptism. What were those? Let's see. I was a little baby. I don't really remember. Or I don't, I'm not really sure what that was. The promises we made in holy baptism. Uh, I'm going to give you the, the questions and the answers ahead of time. I'm a Boy Scout. I said, so we, we always start every Boy Scout meeting by we make our Scout sign and we say the Scout oath and the Scout law. Scott is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. On my honor, I do my best to do my duty to God, my country. To be a law to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, morally straight. We start every meeting with that. That's our marching orders. So we renew our promises that we made as good scouts. So we never forget them. That's kind of what we're supposed to do every time we're we're at church to remember how it all started. Promises we made in baptism. Well, what what are those? The priest is going to stand up. And there are two parts. There are, there are three questions in two parts, so six total questions. The first thing the priest is going to ask, do you renounce Satan? Well, that's really the whole point of everything we've been doing during Lent. So when we get to this question, we can be gr in greater freedom. If we're just a slave to sin, and we're just going to go back to keep doing the same sin, and very humble here. All of us do that. I mean, we're all attached to, to something. And so, I mean, I try to get to confession weekly if, if possible. And people are like, oh, I just confess the same things. Of course, we just confess the same things. Those are the ones we really need to confess because those are the ones that are, are really keeping us stuck. So all humility, we probably get to Easter and we are not going to be perfect <laughs> by any stretch. But if we've done our testing well, we should at least when we get to Easter be more free to be able to say, do you reject Satan? Like, Boy, I am trying. I, I just did. For the last 40 days, I really, really tried to reject Satan. But it's not easy because he, he's got all his all his works. Like Satan is always trying to take what is good, true and beautiful and, and twist it and, and, and trick us the way he tricked Adam and Eve, our first parents. So all his his empty show. Satan loves to make a big show of things. He even tries to tempt Jesus like, oh, Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Like Jesus is already the king of the world. He's already got all of it. Well, well, if you throw yourself down for the temple, like angels should come catch you, right? Jesus doesn't need to prove anything. But notice Satan is even trying to craft his temptations to try to tempt the son of God. Uh, now, Jesus is perfect, so he passes. We're not. So very humbly, we have to know every day the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to try to tempt us. Hopefully, we get to the end of Lent and we've by exercising our wills in little things, we've learned to say no to little things. I'm, I'm going to say no to the chocolate I really want. And you don't have to give up chocolate for Lent. I actually didn't give up chocolate this year, kind of. At least I didn't make a firm commitment, so I don't know. But in the end, if we do little things, I'm going to say no to that so I can say yes to God. I'm going to say no to that so I can say yes to God. Then you get to Easter and like, do you reject Satan? I do. And, and we'll talk about this more than when we start talking about Easter. But uh, in, in the early church, when they ask this, you know, it, it's not a, a simple I, I do. It's a renuncio, I renounce. And they would, they would even turn and spit to the West. It's great. So mental note in the early church, don't stand on the West wall. If you're watching a baptism, you get spit upon. But it has to be, you know, if we're really going to mean this, well, we have to we have to practice. So all during Lent, what we're really doing is practicing this. Yes, I renounce Satan, all his works, all his empty show whether it comes in the form of some illicit temptation we're finding on the internet or some illicit cookie that we gave up for Lent. Well, we're going to try to say no. But again, the Christian faith is not fundamentally a no. It, it's yes. So the only reason we say no to these three things is so we can say yes to this. So this is the second half of the test. 
the first half, Dear Jack Satan, all his works, all his empty show, I renounce. This is where we're headed. This is the this is the promised land. This is crossing the River Jordan. This is no mistake that right before we enter the waters of baptism, these are the things we have to say we believe. Just as Joshua, when he was finally ready to lead the chosen people into the promised land, he had to ask them, choose today whom you are going to serve. Will it be all these pagan gods that we've been serving, the pagan gods of the land we're going to enter, or will you serve the one true God? And the people all say, we will serve God. And then they're allowed to cross the water into the promised land. We do the same thing in baptism. So second half of the test is this. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? And again, the English is a bit weak here. It says, I do. Uh, in the Latin, and so in the, the official version, it says, credo. Literally, the, from what we get the word creed, credo is, is from two Latin words, cor, meaning heart, and do, which is the first person singular of dare, to give. So credo comes from cor, do, cordo, credo, literally means I give my heart. That's why we had to have the first three questions first, because if we're a slave to sin, if we haven't really learned to say no to anything, we're not really in possession of our hearts. Our hearts are drawn towards sin. How can we be free to say yes to God if we haven't learned to say no to the other things? So having hopefully learned to reject Satan better, now we're free to say, I give my heart. So notice we sometimes call this the Trinitarian formula because it, it's about God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. So do you believe in God the Father? Credo. I, I give my heart. I do. Uh, so notice it's not just uh, an intellectual assent. It's it's our whole selves. By the heart, it's meant our whole self. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, is seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting? I do. Those are the promises we first made in holy baptism, and we will renew them at Easter. So we're starting Lent, heading off into the wilderness, like the chosen people did for 40 years, like Jesus chose to do for 40 days, like we are choosing to do for the 40 days of Lent. It begins going out, leave the city and all that would mean for us, leave the world, the flesh, the devil, go test ourselves. And then the end result is we arrive on the edge of the promised land where we were always supposed to end up. Maybe we took 40 years to get there. Maybe it took us 40 days. Maybe we're, we're still struggling. But God is going to lead us right to the edge of the promised land at Easter, and there will be a river. The Jordan River, in the case of John the Baptist, Jesus, chosen people, for us, baptism. And as we get closer, we'll talk about there are people who are preparing for baptism. The origin of the season of Lent in the Catholic Church is this was a time of preparation for those who were going to be baptized at Easter. And eventually the whole church said, you know, all that preparation that the catechumens, those preparing for baptism are doing, well, we could all do that because like we've all not been faithful to our baptism. We've already been baptized. So why don't we, why don't we all take Lent to get either ready for baptism for the first time or to renew our baptismal promises? So that's the goal. So asking yourself, what should I do for Lent? And it's not too late. Start now. Even if you already blew it, start over. Pick something else. There are no rules. Whatever gets you to this point where you can say, I reject Satan. I choose God. That's the whole goal. That's our Lenten journey. And uh, that's what the, the chosen people did 40 years. Jesus, 40 days. That's what we're doing. So Next week, I think we'll we'll talk a little bit um, about the Transfiguration. So preview of what's coming up this week at Mass. The second Sunday of Lent is normally the Transfiguration. So we'll we'll look that happened at a physical spot. Uh, all this stuff happened at a physical place, and I hope that this Lent, through some of my meditations, will help us to uh, reflect not just on, you know, the spiritual side, but we're also physical people. So hopefully, the tangible places help us also in our spiritual preparation. All right. Any questions before we we sign off? All right. Well, it looks like this room will will do. Thanks for everyone who uh, joined online. Uh, I think this automatically puts the recording in the chat, and then I'll I'll grab that video and I'll put it on SeanTheBaptist.org 
so you can find it after it deletes it from the, the cloud and, and share amongst yourselves. And if anyone has any questions that you want me to answer, email me, send me a chat, whatever. Um, but let's uh, let's end in a prayer and, and pray for each other. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Dear God, we thank you for everyone who took their time over lunch today to leave the rest of the world for a little bit to go to the wilderness uh, to, to meditate upon you, upon our journey through Lent. Jesus, what, whatever we choose this Lent, let it all be about you, directed towards you, that each day we can say no to the things we need to say no to and a greater yes to you. May it not take us 40 years to turn our hearts towards you, but may we know that you go with us, that this journey is ultimately about a relationship with you. Jesus, you are with us. We pray that you would bless our time of Lent and lead us to the joys of Easter. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody.